Hello, hello, hello. There we go. Good morning, Lithuania. You guys excited to be here? Because I'm excited to be here. I came all the way from Silicon Valley to a country that I didn't even know existed. Very, very, very happy to be here. So I've come here to talk about potential, about your potential, my potential, how uh, some of the lessons I've learned from mistakes I've made might help you from preventing those mistakes. One of the lessons I've learned is that if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to look like an entrepreneur. Another lesson I've learned is it doesn't matter how good you look, it's more important how you make people feel and what you do. I also realized that if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you need to conquer your fears. And to speak to 1,200 people, I had a fear last night about being in my underwear on stage. So I decided this morning to conquer that fear. So thank you. A little bit about me. I'm a, I'm a triplet. I grew up in New York, uh, New York State. Echo, hello. I come from a, a background of entrepreneurs. My grandfather invented a snack food. It's called Doritos. Has anybody heard of Doritos? Anybody like Doritos? My father, he was in the bottled water industry. And when I went away to college, I asked myself an important question. I asked myself, what business, what business can I enter that will never be obsolete and can never be outsourced? Now, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but this was an important question. And, uh, um, you know, really, it, it struck me at one point. I got food poisoning. As with a lot of college students, I ate really, really poor food. And after one particularly bad meal at Taco Hell, I, uh, I spent three days uh, recuperating. And at the end of those days, I decided I really needed to learn how to cook. So I called my twin brother, Chris, who was in culinary school. I said, Chris, how do you cook chicken? So I went into the kitchen. I heated up a pan, a little bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, and I cooked some chicken. And wouldn't you know it, there was a knock on the door. It was a buddy of mine from down the hall. He had smelled the chicken, and he wanted me to share. Well, then there was another knock. And before I knew it, I had a dozen friends in my room, and they all wanted me to share that chicken. That's when I had what I call my first food epiphany. I realized that if I learned to cook, it was a skill that would help me be healthy, it was a skill that would help me make friends, and it was a skill that I could travel with. And I really believe that, uh, that travel is the best form of education. So right there I decided to join my brother at the Culinary Institute of America in New York. And um, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, it was at school that I, you know, I, d I started to take uh, my education more seriously. I started to join extracurricular activities. We started a club, the, uh, the Chef's Sustaining Agriculture Club. Uh, th our gastronomy professor, she'd introduced us to the slow food movement. Anybody here familiar with the slow food movement? Yeah, we got a few out there. So the slow food movement is a global community uh, of people that are dedicated to preserving biodiversity, and the pleasures of the table. So we wanted to educate chefs at the Culinary Institute of America about sustainability. But wouldn't you know, we actually found out that m they were more interested in drinking beer than they were about learning sustainability. Who here likes beer? There we go. For breakfast, anybody? Yeah, I bet some of you out there. So what we did is uh, turned into one of my life's biggest lessons. We decided to do a beer event. And we, did, we put together a beer symposium where we brought in three philosophers to lecture on beer, food, and culture. And this, uh, this corresponded with the launch of a beer called Three Philosophers by Brewery Omegang in New York. Well, that event was one of the most successful events any students put on at the Culinary Institute of America. And the lesson that I took away from that was that if you appeal to people's self-interests, you can accomplish most anything. <coughs> so after, uh, you know, after graduating from school, I really felt good. I wanted to go out there and, 
my brother and I started the Edible Education Project. It was a nonprofit. I taught cooking and farming classes for kids. He taught cooking and farming classes for seniors with dementia. And we did intergenerational classes together. But as some of you know, the nonprofit world is not very profitable. So I took a real job at the St. Regis Hotel in New York. And uh, it was at the St. Regis that I really wanted to learn to cook for quantity. How do I make really, really great food for a lot of people at once? And we were doing um, anywhere up to 600 meals a day uh, at 250 to $750 a person, really high-end food. And uh, I, it was at the St. Regis that I cooked for Johnny Depp, the Saudi royal family, Elton John, Sophia Loren, Martha Stewart, Kanye West, blah, 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 blah. And what I realized was that those people that I, were, I was feeding weren't feeding me. So that's when I had to do a, a kind of a, a, a look inside myself. And I decided to leave. And I decided to, after three years of learning to cook, I was going to go to California. Who here has been to California? Anybody love California beside all these guys over here? Oh, soon many of you will, I promise. It's a wonderful place. This is Dolores Park, and in 2008, Carlo Petrini, the founder of the Slow Food Movement, had written a book called Slow Food Nation. And it culminated in San Francisco with a big food festival. So my brother and I organized, on behalf of the youth food movement, an Eden. This is a picture of a 250-person table at the top of the Dolores Park. It's a sit-in potluck, a form of political protest where we sat down and enjoyed food and community the way we want to live. And the police came to this protest and we fed them. And if, if ever you're in a position with police, feed them. It, it helps a lot. So um, after Slow Food Nation, I felt really jazzed. You know, I knew I was finding my passion in life. Uh, and it was at that point that my brother and I were invited to represent the United States at Terra Madre. Terra Madre is a world meeting of the food communities. It happens every two years. Uh, in Torino, Italy. It's kind of like the United Nations of food. And I met people from all around the world that cared as deeply about these issues as I did. And that inspired me even more. And I decided I was going to go back to the United States and I was going to instigate food revolution. And that if it was going to begin, it had to begin in our education system. So I chose the land-grant university of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And it was there that I, I brought together my friends and I started taking classes and uh, I got a degree in sustainable food systems and social food movements. I was working for UMass Dining, again, uh, trying to learn to cook for as many people as possible, as sustainably as possible. UMass is the third largest self-operated food service in the United States, doing 40,000 meals a day. My kitchen did 8,000 a day. And uh, I really wanted to start a garden. So I went to the chancellor and I said, you know, you know, I convinced a, a group of people to write a climate action plan to uh, achieve carbon neutrality in food. And the first step was education. I said, uh, you know, we need a garden. Chancellor said, that's great. You know, I said, I've got a spot chosen. He said, I'm sorry, we're turning that into a parking lot. Didn't, didn't go over well, um, but I had an idea. I went to his wife. Yes, I found her in the dining hall with her kids, and I told her all about my idea for a garden. She said, that's great. I said, you know, you know, your husband wants to turn it into a parking lot. Guess who got the grassy area? Never under underestimate the power of women. That's the lesson there. So um, this garden was the first permaculture garden, edible forest garden, on a land-grant university in the United States. The concept in my mind was to get students to pay to get certified, take classes in permaculture, thus transitioning the landscape itself into an edible forest garden that sells food back to the dining halls at a subsidized price. Let's just say it was successful. We won the Champions of Change Challenge and were sent to the White House. Um, at that point, my brother had gone off to California. And he was teaching a health, wellness, and nutrition class for Latinos at risk for obesity. And he had gotten a phone call from uh, uh, a private family in Connecticut that wanted a private chef. So he flies back to Connecticut, and I'm thinking, oh, great, we're going to be on the same coast. 
Well, he gets a job offer and he also gets another phone call. He gets a phone call from the executive chef of Facebook who invites him out to audition for a job. He had heard about him through some friends. So he flies back to California and he meets with the chef of Facebook and he cooks for him and he gets another job offer and he says to the chef, you know, I'm sorry, I've got a better offer in Connecticut. If only I had an identical twin brother that could cook, I could take both jobs. Lo and behold, I get a phone call. I fly to California, I get a job offer on the spot. I leave my girlfriend and I go to open Cafe 6 at the Facebook headquarters. This is a picture of one of the kitchens. This is a nacho bar. That right there is Katy Perry. Anybody know who Katy Perry is? I had no idea. <coughs> so I'm thinking, I'm going to Facebook. They've got to be one of the most innovative companies in the world. And in my mind, it takes about, let's say, 16 to 17 minerals and nutrients to grow food, to grow plants. But it takes about 80 or so to grow humans. Now, are our farmers growing plants, or are they growing humans? Nutrient-dense foods produce nutrient-dense humans. Nutrient-dense humans are healthier, happier, and more productive. So for me, that was really my goal, to, to feed as many people as sustainably as possible and to grow nutrient-dense humans. Um, catch up. So at that point, I saw this amazing energy that was swirling around Silicon Valley, and I thought to myself, I can do that. I met a couple of girls, one of which was from Airbnb. Who here is familiar with Airbnb? Okay, a few of you. Airbnb is a company that has disrupted the entire hotel industry. They have unlocked these underutilized resources, people's guest rooms in their homes. And they've enabled those people to share those with complete strangers, thus connecting people and making money in the process. So this girl had an idea to do the same for food. So I met her and, and I started talking with her idea while I was working at Facebook. And I said, you know, you gotta go to South by Southwest. You know, it's this amazing interactive film music festival going on in Austin, Texas. And she said, yeah, that sounds great. Well, she called me the next day and she said, we're in a car, we got a film crew, we're going to Austin. And she said, do you want to come? I said, sure, why not? Long story short, Grubbly was born. We created a platform just like Airbnb, but for food. This is a rooftop in San Francisco. This is a chef. Actually, I met this guy at a farmer's market. He was doing raw food. At the time, he had a raw food cafe at Google. And uh, uh, shareable.net is an online leading magazine in the sharing economy. Kind of this post-capitalistic, how do you unlock underutilized under resources uh, magazine. And uh, they asked us, grubbly, to present at Share San Francisco, and we did. And they asked me to throw the after party. So I gave three chefs $200 each and asked them to cook as much food as they could. And Sam was one of the chefs. And at the end of the night, Sam had more food than anybody else, and he gave me back 50 bucks. And uh, he'd done it just because he loved to do it, just because he wanted to have fun. Well, the next day, I got a call from Airbnb. They were looking for a chef, but they didn't have a kitchen. Turns out they wanted a raw food chef. Turns out a new one. Sam is now executive chef of Airbnb. That, to me, is a, a pure example of how if you follow your passion and you do what you love, opportunity will come to you. Now, I'd love to say that, you know, Grubbly took off and we went public and we raised 15 million, but we didn't. As uh, the previous presenter said, a startup world is a roller coaster. There was unforeseen circumstances that transpired, AKA my engineer confessed his love for my co-founder who left her boyfriend and then took a leave of absence. There's things that you can't foresee in the startup world. So what did I do? My, my startup's in the dirt. I went to Burning Man, of course. Anybody heard of Burning Man? There's a few of you out there, awesome. Burning Man is one of the world's most amazing art festivals. It's in the Nevada desert. It's a pop-up city of 60,000 people. And uh, there's no currency, completely trade, no advertising. 
Spending a week in the desert with 50,000 people was the most civilized thing I've ever done in my life. And when I got back, uh, I did what I always do. I fed people and I made friends. That's when Neil from Shareable asked me, hey, do you want to go to Austin for South by Southwest and throw another party? I said, why not? So I said, all right, you know, I'm broke. I'm an entrepreneur. Pay, pay my way and I'll go. So he says, all right, well, do you want to write about it? Do you, you know, do you want to take a road trip? Enter Startup Bus. Startup Bus is a hackathon on a bus on the way to Austin for three days. Ten buses this year uh, from all around the country, including Mexico, all head to Austin. Now, I had cooked for a bunch of hackers. I, I had never actually done a hackathon in my life. Um, but I said, what the heck? I'm a hustler. I can do this. So uh, I got on the bus. And uh, lo and behold, I found a team. We came up with a silly idea. The idea was for custom breakfast cereal. And we started thinking. We said, well, you know, let's think inside and outside the box. So why not? Let's, let's enable people to customize what's in the box and what's on the box. Excuse me. So we began having fun with it. We started to uh, build a website in three days on a bus. This is the power of good engineers and good designers. Um, made it super simple. Uh, but the whole while, we're just having fun with this. It's a joke. I'm tweeting out every few minutes some new joke about cereal. And, uh, you know, we, s we decide, well, you know, why not just build a website? Let's, let's make some cereal. So by the time we got to Austin, we had made many boxes of cereal. We made Apple Jacks, Cinnamon Tech Crunch, Robert Scoble's Scoble Eyes, and my favorite, Dave McClure's Fucking Flakes. By far the most popular. Dave McClure is a foul mouth venture capitalist from the Valley, if some of you don't know. So uh, needless to say, uh, you know, we, we get into the competition, we get to Austin, there's a bunch of buzz. We get into the grand finals, and I'm nervous. I had never done anything like this before. I just needed a ride to Austin. And uh, we burst in the room, and I say, who wants cereal? We give out cereal boxes in the audience. I go up to the judges. I give them each a bowl, spoon, milk, and a box of cereal. And I go up to McClure, he's a judge, and I say, these are the last effing flakes in Austin. Well, they begin chowing down on cereal as we begin talking about our market size and our product. McClure breaks out 10 bucks. He goes, here's your first effing sale. Next judge. This is possibly the stupidest idea I've ever heard, and it's probably going to make a billion dollars. We had fun. We won. We got a bunch of press, but it was all because we just enjoyed it. Well, let's just say we turned it into a company. We incorporated in March, and uh, we've run a bunch of tests. I built a team. Our, our latest product is Romney Flakes and Obama O's. I guess you all know which one won. And uh, that is how I became a serial entrepreneur. Thank you.